right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Nick Horn, who is in Oxfordshire in the UK or Oxfordshire, as most of my American friends would call it. <laughs> How are you doing, Nick? Yeah, really well. Thanks for having me, John. No, absolutely. And Nick is Global Brand Experience Leader at Reckitt. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is what's a brand? And and this is I love this conversation because I've had this with the with a number of people, and it is still amazing how many people still sort of think brand is logo or colors or you know your bumper sticker tagline or whatever it is you come up with um but brand as we know needs to encompass the whole organization and become part of the dna so nick how do you set about on that path of making number one it's like identifying what your brand is and then making a part of the company dna yeah i mean i think it's about acknowledging that history as you said john um you know, in, in its most basic term, a brand originally was a brand mark. It was a visual mm -hmm. indicator of, of, frankly, whose sheep were whose. Um, yeah. And in the in that era, it was quite a passive object. But but clearly, brands have developed since then. And, you know, we move forward to the 1950s and media bias comes into play and, and brands become a representation of a, a product, a person, a, a company. And, you know, there's that classic Campbell's uh, soup poster where you kind of start to play with semiotics and, and visual design plays a larger role and, and brands begin to broadcast. But I think if we start to fast forward to the, the 2020s, our, you know, our current era, brands are super personified. They're able to join a cultural discussion. And I, I always think about Nike supporting an equal playing field by taking a stance on things like the civil rights movement. So we're moving to brands being far more community focused um, and turning from sort of broadcast to conversational expressions and being part of a cultural context, which is a, a super exciting time to be part of a, a brand's development. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I love that you've mentioned the sheep because my son, when he was younger and we used to go back to Ireland, he used to love seeing all the, sh all the sheep just wandering around in the west of Ireland and then with their different colors on them. And you'd say, wow, what's all this? And say, well, that's how the farmers know it's theirs. That's it. It's a, it's a brand mark. Um, exactly. It's a brand, a brand mark. So, um, so, uh, so brands have started to expand. And as you say, I mean, some of them are getting into, you know, different, different areas. But I do feel like you have to start from a base of who you really are, because if you try to be something that you're not or you end up, as I think, unfortunately, some companies do end up with kind of bumper stickers, I call them on your website, making these proclamations, but it's not reflected in the company. So, I mean, how do you start? I mean, if, as you said, you've got to start off and figure out, is this something that's authentically you? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, to stick with the, the analogy of Nike for a second, it's it's about unlocking what a brand's purpose is. It's about un, uncovering what a brand stands for, what conversations it should be having or, or has a right to have, what personality ha it has, what, what values it has, what, what beliefs it has. Um, but underpinning that, you, you were talking a little bit earlier about how we embed that into company culture and and, you know, making sure that individuals within a company that work on that brand have an aligned purpose and they're able to use those brand platforms to to further their individual goals and i was i was listening to some of your previous podcasts and i i really enjoyed uh, diana singh who had a lot of insight around that topic mm -hmm. but i i also think there's something around empowerment so how do we create a culture of ownership where people can explore that brand platform and have a clear view on how they can turn that purpose into meaningful interactions with our, our brand's community. So if I think about one of our brands, Vanish, which is a, a laundry booster that gives clothes new lives, mm -hmm. our teams are working with the British Fashion Council, for example, and, and fashion designers to promote rewear, as well as on-demand services like uh, Oxwash to, to keep garments in circulation for as long as possible. But that that only really comes as a result of a culturally aligned and empowered team that can translate that brand purpose into amazing partnerships. And ultimately, that's how you, you start to embed brands into a company's DNA and you, you start to be able to explore those different interactions that a brand's community can be part of. 
Uh, and I and I presume as part of that, then you need to recruit to the brand, if you like, in in many ways. Say just the example that you you're talking about there. Uh, when you're bringing people, maybe when that company is bringing people in, they would obviously have to be aligned with the brand purpose in uh, in so that they will also be able to to communicate and not just communicate because they have to, but communicate because they want to. Yeah, exactly. And it, uh, and you you think about it in the context of how many interactions are being had across the world mm -hmm. to make sure that the individuals are a really solid representation of that brand, that really understand that purpose, that really understand how uh, the brand's community is going to react in their certain countries to you know certain partnerships, certain types of marketing behaviors, etc. Um, it's really important that people not just live and breathe that specific purpose, but certainly have a belief around the, the kind of direction that the brand is going and that their own purpose somehow marries up with that, that they can literally stand there and represent our brands in the best possible way. Yeah, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the empowerment, which I agree with, but also the, the, um, with empowerment, obviously, it comes the accountability piece because, I mean, let's face it, a customer's experience is a holistic one or a prospect, or whatever. It's an end-to-end -end experience. And therefore, if one part of the chain breaks down, I always like to, I always use the example of flying, right? You can get to the airport on time. You can get checked in beautifully. You can get through security and get on the plane. Flight's fine, arrives on time. And then your baggage is delayed and there's nobody there to help or announcement. Now, suddenly, this is the worst trip you've ever been on, even though 99% of it was great. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's one of those things, if we, if we have a great brand purpose in place, we have a culture of empowered people internally, we then need to understand the journey we want our brand communities to go on, what, what touch points are within that journey, how people interact with them. And the team I belong to at Reckitt set those guiding principles for that journey. And it's, and it's varying touch points. And that, that sort of comes to life in the form of a, an omni-channel brand world. And that sounds like a very grandiose statement, but in a sense, it's the guiding light for our brand experience that is then deployed across 70 or so different countries, uh, across our different channels, and then is deployed by our creative agencies, our e-commerce teams, our trade teams, social, CRM, digital marketing. And I think it's super important to have a really strong understanding of why that consumer journey, that user journey exists. Uh, what are the high value touch points within it? And then once you create that brand world, it can become a, a single point of reference for all those people that are involved in deploying our brands to market. Mm -hmm. And it's only by having that, that sort of North Star, if you like, can you deploy a brand holistically. Yeah. Um, so we explain to the, the, the viewers and listeners the, the concept of what a brand community means. So brand community, uh, as we were talking about earlier, the brand's no longer about just a, a visual passive mark. Mm -hmm. It's about all the people that are, are buying your products. It's all about the people that are engaging with you. And uh, I was reading something the other day that was saying that uh, if, a, if a conversation about a brand is going to happen, whether a brand's there to hear it or not, whether a brand's there to engage it or not. So as I said, that kind of principle of moving from a brand being a kind of passive or broadcast style mm -hmm uh style um approach actually we are moving to this world where it's conversational and in any conversation it's about cementing community cementing advocates and and being involved in that kind of cultural context in which your brand sits yeah no that's um thank you that's that's uh that's fascinating and i think it, and it's definitely changing the dynamic a lot because um, as you as you uh, mentioned earlier I mean, people are interacting with brands now probably based on a maybe a broader set of criteria than they once maybe would have, uh, where it was like product, okay, good product, I'll buy it. Now it's product, who who produces it? Why do they produce it? You know, what yeah. what's what's the essence of the company like? And and these are these are things that I feel like a lot of companies uh, haven't woken up to, so they're still very disjointed within the organization. Um and it's not a it's not it's not understood by everybody or communicated properly by everybody no i agree and uh, and uh, you know we we talk about brand exposures you know we've mm -hmm. we've moved from uh, you know a time when people might have been exposed to one ten uh, maybe a hundred yeah. brand exposures at best and you know maybe we can play a little game john um yeah, sure. if you want to 
if you want to shut your eyes briefly and maybe just for five seconds and think of the brands that actually inspire you that that speak to you that that somehow capture your heart and mind um it'd be just great to to maybe list some of those i reckon i'm going to take a guess you may be able to think of one maybe two or three yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I would think uh, I'm I'm big into martial arts stuff. So the UFC, I think, yeah. like f- f- that that you know, just the way they do everything, they have a fantastic like they built that brand, you know, then took it from when they bought it, it was nearly bankrupt to like the world power it is today. But it's everything it does is it just does in a particular context, and you get to know the individuals on a much deeper level than you do in many sports, actually, I think. And so the, the brand is a very powerful, but it's a very, it's a very one-to-one as well, because the athletes themselves, you know, communicate a lot. So that's why I just think it's a very, very interesting brand. Well, and that sort of reinforces the conversation we're having about communities. And you mm-hmm. think we're, we're bombarded by something like 5,000 exposures per day. I don't know whether that's the latest stat, but mm-hmm. uh, it is something remarkable like that. So when you do think of brands that inspire, they're likely to be conversing with you. They're likely to be taking you on a journey and, and to your point, make you feel somehow part of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that's the key because I think, um, I mean, this was happening pre-pandemic. Uh, I think people were starting to crave a little bit more um, connection. Obviously, the pandemic accelerated that. But connection with with the companies that they or the brands that they do business with, like even as as consumers, because let's face it, I mean, if you go back f- five, ten years, we were starting to get into this idea where technology could be used to kind of you know keep everybody a little bit at an arm's length and kind of funnel them down particular tracks, and that's just not what people want anymore. The people can't stand that. You know, they want to deal with brands who they want to know that there's people behind the brands. I think that's what I'm trying to say. No, I agree. And I, I, I used this example the other day. I, my, my headphones broke and uh, it, it was a, a, a premium brand of headphones and, and their response was to say WhatsApp me. So I'm suddenly having this WhatsApp conversation with you know the headphone brand or presumably an individual on the other side. Mm-hmm. But on my own terms, in my own space, um, on my own time, I'm not sat on a, you know, a, a telephone line waiting mm-hmm. for hours at an end listening to green sleeves um <laughs> i'm i'm able to have a conversation with them and tell them what's wrong and send pictures and uh, w- within seconds you know that was kind of solved a uh, piece of packaging turns up to me on the in the post to, to send them away and some new well i assume new or reconditioned earphones turn up and as an experience that's amazing you know it, it's taken all the stress out of it and you know i know a lot of the, of the kind of discussions that you have on sales pop around technology and it's about sort of how technology can start to enhance these conversations yeah. because as i was talking about earlier people don't want to be broadcasted to anymore it's noisy it's loud it's it's annoying um people want to have basic conversations that allow them to kind of get a feel for the brand and also solve the problems that they have and you know ultimately that that's <laughs> in some ways kind of a, a bit of a caveman instinct but uh you know it comes back to that yeah, so so you're telling me that if you had called them up and got a phone tree and spent a half an hour going from different ones and f- <laughs> selecting selections that never get you to where you want to be and you can't get through to a person or whatever, that would be that's a preferable experience. Oh, come on, no. But yeah. what I love about your what I love about your story is that is that the communicating the way people want to be communicated with. I think that's so so important. I think that that and the and the fact is to be honest, the bar set pretty low right now. So that's the beautiful part about it is if you do start to communicate human to human in a in a very easy way like you just said, your brand's going to stand out much more than it actually should, but it will. Exactly. And in some ways this is the the renaissance that we're we're dealing with because actually, you know, the, the playing field's wide open. Um, there's a lot of new toys and technology that we can start playing with. Um, there's some fantastic developments in that space. Um, but, you know, everyone's on a journey towards that that, that, that area of conversational branding. Um, and some are kind of behind the curve, you know, still very much focused on that kind of broadcast style, shouting at you as a brand on TV. But it's just not sticky. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, you know, you're yeah. relying on the right person the right place at the right time being open to th- that sort of message 
uh, versus, and, and you spoke about it with, with um, the pandemic sort of accelerating a lot of these things. Um, people are much more open to sort of engaging with brands on different styles of platforms, but you know, it has to be in their own time now. It has to be somehow curated towards that individual. And I'm, I'm trying not to use the word personalization because I think that yeah. is a, a really good space to go to, but it's kind of a long game. But first of all, we just need to get really great at just having the right conversations with people at the right time. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I think that the communication, the conversation part is is critical. And let's face it, I mean, your, you know, your brand, uh, I don't want people to go out the impression that every brand needs to be this kind of holistic and all of these other things. I mean, you can, you can be a company, maybe you produce a product or a service and you just stay very tight and narrow and you just say, here's what we do and this is why we do it. Yep. And we love doing it. And you don't, you don't stray into other areas. That's, that's, that's just as appropriate, right? Oh, I agree. And you think about startups as well. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're people that are doing really strong work in the space because they do have somewhat more of a narrow audience that they're talking to. Um, they, they do have much more specific products potentially. Um, and they are potentially a startup in a specific region, but as brands grow and brands develop, obviously that starts to expand and that sort of curatorship element really needs to come to the fore. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so when you, when you work with, when you work with brands, like what is, what are some of the th key things that you look for as part of the, the brand story? Well, I think it's, it's about sort of uncovering, as I said, the purpose the, mm -hmm. is the brand actually standing for something and is it standing to, for something that's relevant to the brand? Can it actually play a role in that? So we've talking about one of the brands that I look after, which is, is Vanish and, you know, um, standing for uh, clothes being like new, mm -hmm. that allows it to sort of uh, converse with certain communities in a certain type of way. You know, it starts to say, okay, well, um, what kind of partnerships do we foster? What kind of uh, charities are we part of? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of audiences are we starting to, to look at uh, opening channels of communication with? Um, so that's kind of the very first step. The second step is, then if we have that purpose, are we actually deploying it successfully? Is it coming to life across that user journey? Mm -hmm. um, is the creative upon those touch points actually working effectively? And is it taking people on a journey, a funnel if you want to call it that, um, that is you know, allowing people to develop a relationship with that brand? And so those are the kind of three main things. Do we have a great purpose? Do we understand our journey? Do we understand our, our users? And are we actually having the right conversation that funnel people through that journey? And I think a lot of brands, if you look at them sort of at their core, potentially don't necessarily understand all those steps. Um, and I think it's really important to understand those to have a really effective brand conversation. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more because, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the purpose, I'm not sure everybody has figured that out yet. Um, I think there's a lot of people kind of scrambling and sort of going, oh, our company needs a purpose. Let's throw this on. On, on the website. So, uh, uh, and then obviously you need to make sure, as you said, the journey, the, the customer journey that you can actually align with that because there's not, there wouldn't be anything worse, wouldn't there, than being saying, oh, here's our purpose. And then you're completely misaligned with the way your customers operate. Yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> it's funny, <laughs> isn't it? We, we keep talking about things like value signaling, virtue signaling, mm -hmm. wealth signaling. I mean, all, all these are signals are there because people do want to somehow align to a, uh, you know, a brand's brand's point of view. They they want to purchase or be part of a community that somehow aligns with their own. Um, but if you have a, a weak link in that in that journey, that somehow we're not deploying our purpose mm -hmm. effectively, it's 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 not understood for whatever reason. Then we that's the kind of area that we need to start focusing our energies into um, solving in essence. Okay, so listen, fantastic today, Nick. All of Nick's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Nick, please do tell people a little bit more about you and Reckitt. Uh, I certainly can, John. So um, my, my background was, was in design, in product design originally. Um, but obviously products uh, are, are sort of no longer just physical artifacts. They are expanding out absolutely everywhere. Um, to be multiple, multiple touch points. So uh, I sort of describe myself as a, a self-confessed brand geek. 
Um, hmm. I absolutely love it. And I've been working in consultancies for, for extremely large brands uh, on kind of sustainable innovation pipelines and, and such for probably the past 10, 15 years. Um, wreck it as a company um, it exists to protect heal and, and nurture in the relentless pursuit of a cleaner and healthier world and and that really sort of helps fire up my desire for innovation in that space um, wreck it as a business is is kind of split across uh, health uh, hygiene and nutrition um, and I sit in the the hygiene portion of that business, and it has some of the best love brands in the world. Um, love, if we're talking about it, we have Jurex, we have KY Jelly. Um, <laughs> if we're talking about sort of hygiene based products, we have, I'm sure the the audience in America know Lysol very well, um, oh, yeah. Heartbeat, for example. And we scale innovations across um, across multiple geographies. So Vanish, the brand I look after, is in seventy plus or so different countries. Um, and it's it's just a very exciting place to be. So I uh, hope that gives you a little snapshot. As yeah, well as yeah. That, about. Yeah, no, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Nick. Hey, listen, thank you for today. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you.